guys, I hope that you were all doing well, all doing okay. Welcome to the anniversary. It is my true crime series where I take a crime and tell you about it on the anniversary of it happening. All of the stories that I talk about are hand-picked, researched and narrated by me and told in under 10 minutes. For further information, I always list all of the sources and the podcasts and the documentaries that I watch in the description box, so make sure you check that out. If you like what I do, if you like what you see, then make sure you comment nice stuff, like and subscribe. This isn't really about the amount of people that are watching, but I would love to see this little series grow and see more people who look a little bit different tackling true crime. This week marks the anniversary of a crime that I remember personally like it was yesterday. On Saturday the 1st of July, 20 years ago, the Payne family all bundled into the family car to go to their grandparents for dinner. They got there, they ate their food, which happens to be shepherd's pie, and they went down for a walk to the beach. After a little while, the kids wanted to stay, but the adults wanted to move on. There was begging, there was pleading, and promising to be good. Their mum, Sarah, reluctantly agreed to let them stay on at the beach and play. I should add that this is in the year 2000, and also the beach was really close to the grandparents' house. It really wasn't very far at all. And one of the kids was 13 or 12 the oldest kid at the time. There comes a time, I think, in every parent-childhood relationship that you have to give them a little bit more freedom. So after telling the kids that they needed to be home before dark, that they needed to stick together, and their oldest brother was in charge, their mum agreed. They played in a field that was super close to their grandparents' house, and I've read in some places that it was a couple of hundred yards, and in other places it was a couple of minutes walk, so it wasn't very far, and the kids knew the area because they often frequented where their grandparents lived. In Kingston Gorse, West Sussex in England. What happened was, was Sarah, who was eight at the time, she fell over and she hurt herself and she had had enough. She was a really sensitive kid and she just wanted to go back to the house. So she began running down to the lane. Her older brother ran after her and then he turned around when the youngest sister, who was five at the time, she fell over into some nettles, looked back to where Sarah was and she was gone. She had disappeared. What he did see was a man in a white van drive past while they were looking through the bush looking for Sarah and he described the man as having gappy teeth, that he was really dishevelled, had shaggy hair and the man waved at him and smiled as he drove past. The kids not being able to find her, ran to their grandparents' home to where their nan was and they looked throughout the entire house. They searched upstairs, downstairs, in cupboards, in the bathrooms, thinking that Sarah might be playing a trick on them. She was nowhere to be seen. The parents got back to the home. Sarah, the mum, said that she knew something was wrong immediately because when they started approaching the house, the grandma was standing outside and she asked them if they have Sarah and of course they didn't. So they started panicking. They went to the neighbour's house and everybody began searching the area together. This is the English countryside in July. You know, the fields were quite high, the grass was quite high and they were just looking and looking and looking for young Sarah. They didn't call the police for a couple of hours and I think the reason they didn't is because, you know, she might have fallen over, she might have got lost and, you know, like once you notify authorities, once you call the police, it's like you've accepted that something bad has happened. The police took this very seriously and Sarah's image, the picture of her in her red school jumper, is just burned into my mind. I think anybody who was alive in the year 2000 knows what Sarah Payne looked like because this picture was all over the news, it was all over the bulletins. They really tried to find this baby girl. It kind of brought the country together. I think everyone was really rooting for the Payne family, hoping that they found her, doing the research and finding out exactly what went down in the case of Sarah Payne. It's just heartbreaking, I think, because I remember it. The parents of Sarah Payne, specifically her mum, actually, did numerous TV appeals and in a lot of them, her mum looked into the camera and spoke directly to Sarah, you know, telling her that they were looking for her, that they weren't going to rest until they found her, and they can't wait to have her home. The police thought they knew who had her. There was a registered sex offender in the area, but they just couldn't prove it. 
There was a man called Roy Whiting and he was a convicted sexual offender. In 1995, he grabbed a nine-year-old girl off of the street. He took her to an abandoned field and he sexually assaulted her and he let her go. And he also lived really close to where she went missing, to where Sarah went missing, where she was last seen. Roy Whiting was questioned and he told the police that he went for a drive on the coast on the day that Sarah went missing, that he was actually miles away from the area in Hove. He went to a fun fair and the police couldn't do anything but let him go. They did decide, however, to keep an eye on him, to watch him. And soon after questioning, Roy Whiting walked to his van and he opened the door. A receipt fell on the floor and one of the officers, who's a G, thought, what's that? And he said, let's, let's go and see what that is. It ended up being a receipt for um, a petrol station that was miles away from Roy, where Roy said that he was. And the police were really confused because they were like, if you have evidence that you weren't in this area around the time of Sarah's disappearance, why have you said that you were so far from where you actually were? They really didn't know why he lied about that. He spent two days in custody. There was no evidence to press any charges, so he was released on bail. For 16 days, her parents waited and hoped. For 16 days, they made appeal after appeal for Sarah Payne to come home. For 16 days, Sarah Payne's parents prayed that their daughter would be brought back to them, but it didn't happen. On the 17th of July, the body of eight-year-old Sarah Payne was found in a shallow grave, 15 miles from where she went missing. It suddenly made sense why Roy Whiting had lied. The receipt from the petrol station was very close to the grave site of Sarah Payne. On the 20th of July, a shoe was recovered from a roadside in the village of Coolum, which is three miles from where Sarah Payne was discovered, and it was identified as belonging to her. A woman who said that she thought nothing of it at first, but then felt maybe it might be relevant to the investigation, had seen it discarded on the side of the road. It was a simple black child shoe, size 13, with a Velcro strap. Velcro is one of the most forensically aggressive materials. It picks up every single fibre that it touches, which is both a dream and a nightmare, because whilst it will probably have what you're looking for, it will also have everything else. When it comes to Velcro, everybody is invited to the party. The police found hundreds of fibres on this shoe. They also got the time they needed to investigate this case when Roy Whiting bizarrely stole a car and got into a high-speed chase with the police on the 23rd of July. He was remanded in custody, so that really, really gave the police the time they needed to investigate this without fear that he was going to strike again and attack another child. They researched his van and they meticulously, forensically analysed it. They found loads of fibres, loads of stuff in the van. But importantly, they found one blonde hair that they could use for DNA. It was a 10 million to one shot that that hair did not belong to Sarah Payne. Sarah's shoes also yielded fibres that matched items in Roy Whiting's van, a pair of socks that were in the van and a, and a red jumper and the front seat. On February the 6th, 2001, Roy Whiting was charged with the abduction and the murder of Sarah Payne. So he was charged seven months after she first went missing. And during the trial, the jury weren't allowed to know about his previous conviction in 1995 and that he was already on the sexual offenders register, which when he was convicted, in December of 2001 and sentenced to a minimum of 40 years in prison. The press and the public really disliked that decision. You know, the, the system is supposed to have been designed for him not to have offended again. Sarah's mum, Sarah, began campaigning after the trial. And now we have something called Sarah's Law, which is the right to know where registered sexual offenders live in your area. You can go to your local police station and you can request the information and they have to tell you. So I'm not saying that something good came out of the, the, the killing of an eight year old girl, of course not. But I do think that it is very admirable that her mum went on to campaign and to try and make a difference. Yeah, that's the story of Sarah Payne very condensed of course but yeah thank you for watching and i'll see you guys next week for another installment of the anniversary